Good evening, everyone. If we would, make our way to our seats. Get ready to come into the presence of the Lord. I'm thankful to be here tonight. Thankful to see what the Lord is going to do in this place. I know he's going to do a mighty work. I was listening to something today, and it's guy was talking about some redwood trees, and I thought it was really, really cool, but I, I went home and I looked it up, and it, redwood trees have a unique, a unique root system that is shallow compared to their size, but what helps them withstand the winds and the flood is how their roots develop. The, the, redwood, the redwood tree roots grow 6 to 13 feet deep. Then the then the roots spread horizontally 60 to 100 feet from the trunk. And the redwood roots intertwine with other redwoods in the grove for stability. But it made me think, how much do we need to be rooted together in this place? How much do we need to be an assembly together in this place? And when we're alone, the enemy is it's easier for the enemy to convince us that we don't have nobody and we we just need to go on about our business but when we come together and we're in unity together brother Ronnie we're, we're stronger the Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name so is he and I'm thankful to be in this place with y'all but we are stronger together our motto is we're better together and I know we are and because we all bring something to one another that makes somebody better we can help one another when we fall we can we can stand in the gap for one another. We can pray for one another. We can intervene for one another. And I'm thankful for the unity that is in this church. And I'm thankful for the growth that is in this place. But let's just go together in prayer tonight. Let's, let's just pray together. And Lord, we just love you, Lord. And Lord, we're thankful for what you're doing in this place. And Lord, we need you to show up. And we need you to put the work in us. And Lord, we need you to... Take the imperfections out of us, Lord, and mold us and shape us in your likeness and your image, Lord. And Lord, I know that you're going to have your way in this place. And Lord, I pray over the needs that are in this place. And I pray that your hand is upon the sick. And Lord, I just pray that you will be with them tonight. And Lord, just whatever you are wanting to do, Lord, I pray that we will allow it. And I pray that we will just yield ourselves to you. And Lord, I just love you and thank you.
Let's just lift up that name right now. There's no other name like the name of Jesus in this place. That name changed my life. That name put purpose in my life. That name washed all my sins away. Now it became new through him, Brother Shannon. I'm thankful for that name. I'm thankful that we're here tonight to worship the one and only true God. If we would get the ways to give on the board, we got GiveLify, we got PayPal available to RiverbendPentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, 1031 at Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We got text to give, 888-833-9311. And if you would, let's... Let's just say this prayer in faith tonight. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in. And I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and give.
If he's done a mighty work in your life, let's just bless the name of Jesus right now. Let's just lift up that name. Let's just give him some high praise in this place because he deserves it. Oh, I'm thankful for you, Lord. There's a sweet presence in this place, and I'm thankful to be here tonight. If we will get all the Riverbend kids to come up. we would and let's just pray over these young ones right now and the Lord can use them right now where they're at and this is the next generation and I know he's going to do some big things in their life and I'm thankful for them so if you would let's just stretch our hands to them and let's just pray that the Lord will protect them and cover them every day Lord we just love you Lord and we're thankful for the opportunity to just speak some good things into these kids' life, Lord. I pray that you will use them, Lord, and you will raise them up in the ways that you see fit. Lord, I pray that your word is in their life every day. I pray that it's in their minds and in their hearts, and Lord. I just pray that you will protect them, protect their homes, Lord. Make their homes a safe place, and let there be peace in their homes. And Lord, I just pray that you will have your way in their life. In Jesus' name. Y'all can go back. Well, it's turn to serve service over to Pastor. I know he's got a good word for us, and I'm thankful for him. Somebody say, thank you, thank you, Jesus. I, I was just making sure we were. Amen. Amen. A great crowd tonight. Grateful for our guest. And on, on a Wednesday night at the River Bend Pentecostals, uh, man, it's just, I don't know what to say. But I'll tell you what, some of y'all better not make a covenant with your seat. Because, listen to me now, Sunday morning, we had 161 in-house with over, with 20 Plus absentees. Don't get too comfortable with your seat there. I know some of y'all like your seat, but I'm telling you, God's moving in southeast Missouri. Amen. He's moving. And we're growing. And not just in numbers, but uh, 
in the quality of relationship we have with the Lord. And the series that we're in right now, this is actually the eighth week of it because a couple of them have been two weeks long, but we're studying on doctrine. And I shared with you that no church is stronger than the message it preaches. The message matters. The message matters. It is not the flavor of the week. It is not whatever floats your boat. And, and, and I, I don't want to offend your sense of sensibility, but it is not attend the church of your choice this weekend. It's not. It's who's preaching what the Bible says. And if we're not, I encourage you to pursue it where it is. Amen? Amen. It's that important, folks. I'm going to let everybody get kind of settled down and stuff because y'all were slow out of the gate for worship. Uh, I heard you. And uh, I, uh, we, we have several guests here, and I want you to know we do know how to behave in church. <laughs> we don't always show it, but we know how to behave. And uh, doctrine. In the Jewish culture, we shared with you, Doctrine is defined as a confrontation with the divine will, which means God's way will not always line up with what your carnal mind thinks is okay. The word of God the word of God is designed to challenge us. It is not designed to make you feel good. It is not designed to make you welcome in the club. It is designed to challenge you. And we are going to have to become more of a word people than we ever have been. I feel Jesus in here right now. Let me tell you this. The Bible very clearly says heaven and earth will pass away. But when it goes, the word will still be standing. There's a very well-known evangelist, televangelist, perhaps the number one evangelical evangelist slash pastor in the world today. Who I, I, I heard him say it and I stopped and I recorded it and I wrote it down. And there is a movement afoot in religious circles to diminish the authority and the power of the Bible. The book says it's going to happen. They will not endure sound doctrine. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, if the Bible says that they will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, let God be true and every man a liar. This word is designed to challenge you. This word is designed to challenge me. And it's a blessed thing when you read the word of God and it makes you uncomfortable. That's a good thing. Let's review a little bit from last week. I can tell you right now, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to put her in overdrive tonight. But it's all right; I got it in me. When man was created, he was created last. All right, God's best creation literally was created last, and that wasn't man. That was woe man. And I didn't stutter. Okay. But man, Adam, had characteristics similar to what each of us have. Chances are he was in the five footish range, 165, 170 pounds, and he was placed in a creation. I shared with you last week 139 billion square miles of water. 
when the Bible says the Spirit of God moved on the face of the water, it's not talking about a mud puddle. It's talking about all the water that's on creation. But Brother Robbie, when man was created in relationship with God, the vastness of creation was no big deal. It was just normal. It's just the way it was. And this man was created, Brother Terrence, to live in dominion over all of creation. That's the order of creation. Can I get an amen or something like you believe it? That is the divine order was for man to live in dominion on the earth. Okay? But when man sinned and that connection with God was lost, so was the gauge by which man measured everything and he was lost as well. And when man got lost, did you know all the creation got messed up too? Romans 8 and 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. You see, the effects of man losing his place has far-reaching ramifications that are reflected and felt throughout creation. Where's the dominion? Where's the authority? Man gave it up, and now creation desires reconciliation as well. Worshiping creation, which is what man gravitated toward. Does anybody have an idea of why man gravitated toward worshiping bulls and goats and fish and people? Because it was unexplainable. He didn't know how it got there. Now he's lost his connection to God. So the greatest thing that man is connected to is creation. So he makes a God out of the only unexplainable thing. But yes, Brother Johnny, he could touch it. He could see it. He could fathom it. But it created chaos, Romans 1 and 23, and changed the glory of the uncorru uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now, this is very important that I share with you. And I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say, Brother Burns, that it didn't click with me for many, many years. This has only clicked with me a few years ago, though the Bible teaches it very clearly. When man began to worship idols, they weren't trying to worship another God. They were trying to worship the God their way. Okay? They were connecting with God the only way they knew how, which was through creation. Most generally, they did not set out to worship a different God as much as worshiping the true God the only way they could conceive him, which was within the evidence of his created work. But they quickly found out that these man-made gods, if you please, functioned according to the will of man. So when man decides to start worshiping this table, he found out, Brother Kevin, that he could change that table into whatever standard he wanted, whatever allowance he wanted, and it just so happened that that table became the God that allows me to be who I want to be, how I want to be, with who I want to be, whichever day of the week I want to be, and all of a sudden, Worship has now become completely perverted because where was the anchor? Where was the line? Where was the standard? It was gone. And Adam and Eve wanted to be like God, and when they, found, when they, when they became like God, they found out real fast, quick, and in a hurry, without the governing power of God, all of this ain't going to work. Now, Well, I'm in review still. But now I found out that I like worshiping that table because I like where it's taking me. If something feels good, if something is enjoyable, something satisfies my flesh, Brother Terrence, I incorporate it into worship. Right. Ain't it amazing how that works? 
I don't think this is clicking with us right now. Why in the world do you think there's so many different beliefs and religions and denominations out there? Same principle. Same principle. Somebody found something that felt good, something that they enjoyed, something that a few other people would start believing with them, and they drove a stake in the ground and said, this is it. Everybody all right? I'm reviewing from last week. We're going to talk about the word, the logos, the word, the way that God leads deity and connects with humanity. Without the word, without Logos, we could not even comprehend God. It is the way he reveals himself to us. But there are three issues with God revealing himself to us or with us being reconciled unto God. The first one is, how can you be reconciled to a God you don't know? The second is, how do you connect to a God that the connection has been destroyed? And the third thing is, we have a sin problem. The reason why we can't be connected to God is sin can't come into his presence. Now, I, I, don't have, I, I, I don't have time to unpack it, but I tell you, if you went into the presence of God with sin in your life, you weren't coming out. His holiness demands purity. So we had three revelations, three, excuse me, three issues. Man needs to know God. And, and, and if, you, if you're reading through the bread, you found out that even the Pharisees, they've been reading the Bible for a living. They didn't know him either. He told them. Remember that, Brother Shannon? He told them. He said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you find the words to eternal life. said, them same scriptures testify of me. You don't get it. Ooh. Jesus came, number one, to let man know who God is. Number two, to make a connection available between God and every man. And the third is he came to be the sacrifice that satisfies the penalty for sin. He came that we might know God. We're going to prove that shortly. He came that we might be reconciled to God. And he came that the power of sin might be destroyed because sin is what destroyed our relationship with God in the first place. So let's do a little bit of learning right now. A lot of stuff here. I'm telling you right up front, real fast, quick, and in a hurry. If I unpack everything I got on that handout and everything I got in my notes, y'all did not eat enough supper. Okay? So you're going to have to take this handout. You're going to have to take this lesson. You're going to have to get your Bible, and you're going to have to dive off into this some on your own. Okay? Who is Jesus Christ? He is the incarnation of the one true God. That's who Jesus is. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. Verse 8 says, Beware lest, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So the first one, beware of being spoiled. Now, I have shared with you many times, if you try to always translate King James English into 2024 English, it doesn't always line up just right. Because the word spoil is what happened when your power stayed out too long to all that stuff in your fridge, right? Okay, that's what happens when you uh, let the milk go 
week or 10 days past the due date. Okay? That's not what it's talking about here. That word spoiled is what would happen to a city when an enemy came against it and, and one king would completely annihilate the army of another king. It means to plunder, to take captive or lead away. And what he's saying very plainly right here is beware lest anybody come along and defeat you, destroy you through philosophy If you're not catching up with this, maybe you need to write on your notes there, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verses number about 1 through 6, when Paul said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but it stands in the power of God. He said, I didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Now, beware of being spoiled. Through philosophy, what they did, it's not wrong to think. It is wrong for us to elevate our thoughts above the will and word of God. And in the Greek culture, in the Roman culture, they in effect worshiped intelligence. So philosophy, elevating human wisdom over the wisdom of God. I looked it up in... <laughs> I looked it up in the dictionary. One dictionary says this about the word philosophy. Loving one's own thoughts at the expense of God's word. That's pretty clear to me. Don't get messed up by what people are thinking and saying about what they think. And don't you listen to what anybody says without running it through the word of God. Including me. Don't you just take my word for it. Don't let that make you nervous either because I'm willing to step up to the challenge. But it can't just be blind faith in what somebody says to you. That's why we read the word for ourselves. Those students at Berea were more honorable than the others because they went home and they studied to see if it was true or not. Look here. By philosophy or vain deceit. That means empty or worthless, designed to deceive or cheat. Look here. After the traditions of men. This is a dangerous one. This is a dangerous one. Would y'all agree that it's a dangerous? Why is it dangerous? Because my great-grandma, Lucille, believed this way. And if she believed this way, it had to be right. That is dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. That is dangerous. I love my grandmas, too. And my great-grandmas, too. And if I would have known them, I would have loved my great-great-grandmas, too. But it's not the word of my grandma that causes me to be saved. It's the word of God. Oh, man, alive. I want to I sink that plow right now just a little bit, but I also don't want to get distracted. But I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the word has got to be the authority. It's got to be the authority. He said, beware, lest any man spoil you, mess you up, take everything you've got, tear you down, and leave you with nothing through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Boy, who read the bread today? I don't raise your hands. I don't want you to be embarrassed. Did y'all read in the, if you did read the bread, did y'all read about Joash in there? Oh my goodness, that dude was right on top. He was doing it all right. He was dotting the I's and crossing the T's till Jehoiada died. And then he didn't have a man of God in his life anymore. Ooh, if you ain't read that, you need to because it shook me way down inside of me. 
when the man of God died, they had a big celebration and a funeral for him. And then some people that weren't connected to God came and bowed down before the king. What does that do? Pumped his head up. And he didn't have a man of God in his life. He didn't have a man of God. This today, this is the reading today. He didn't have a man of God to rein him back in and bring him back to the reality that there's only one king. And you serve at his pleasure. Boy, it blew me away when I read that this morning. We cannot be deceived by going after the traditions of men. All right, Lord, I'm going to move on because I sure ain't sure that's the spirit telling me to go on. I think it might be some of me telling me to go on. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Remember from John chapter 1, verse number 3, all things were made by him and there's nothing exists that he didn't make. He was in the world. He made the world and the world didn't even notice him. The rudiments of this world is trying to build and establish a doctrine of salvation upon God-made things instead of on God. All right. You can study this for yourself, and I feel bad that I don't have time to unpack it. I recommend, let me, let me preface my comments by this. 2013, Brother Raymond Woodward preached General Conference in St. Louis, and the title of the message was, In the Name of Jesus. If you've, has anybody ever watched that before, Brother Raymond Woodward? Uh, if you have not watched that sermon, you need to watch it. It's one of the top five sermons that I've ever heard in my life. But we found out through historical records that the doctrine of the Trinity predates Jesus Christ. The Trinitarian doctrine is built upon things borrowed from secular philosophy of the ancient world, which led to a distortion of the true doctrine of God. What happened was the Jewish people, the Bible believers, were one God people. They were the only one God people that existed. And in order for them to fit in with the rest of the religious world, which was polytheistic, Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and such like created the concept of the Trinitarian doctrine in order to fit in with the rest of the religious world. Now, Brother Burns, I know that's a super simple explanation of it. But at the end of the day, that's where it came from. There is no, no inference anywhere to three from Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation with regard to the Godhead. Instead of appealing to tradition, creeds, philosophies, and man-made doctrines, we must adhere to the text, the teaching, and the thought of Scripture itself, according to David K. Bernard, who I promise you, you don't want to mess with. <laughs> we cannot, we cannot when, although I feel a little bit of something rising up in here, Deuteronomy 6 and 4 is the Shema. You cannot see it. But right on the other side of that door, there is a mezuzah that is, that is tacked to the wall of my door right there in my office. And in it is the Shema, which the children of Israel would recite every day. And they were to tell it to their children. And they were to tell it to their grandchildren. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. It was the foundation upon the, which the very fiber of their country existed, not just in church but in government. It was no such thing as church and state. Everything. They were a theocracy, Brother Ronnie, and they were governed by one God. We're going to unpack it. 
don't worry, we're going to unpack it as much as I can in the time that God allows. Look here. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Jesus Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believeth. He and he alone is the only standard by which any human being is measured with regard to salvation. That's why the Bible... That's why the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Woo! The author and finisher of our faith. If you are at any time troubled, discouraged, wearied, and fainting in your minds, look to Jesus. He is the standard. For in him, in who? In Jesus. Verse number eight says, take me back one if you can. Verse number eight says, and not after Christ. Verse number nine says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Who is Jesus Christ? The word Godhead literally in its simplest form means deity and it describes all of who God is, who God was, and who God will be. Although God cannot be less than what he is, the scripture clarifies its intent by using the word fullness. Because the intent of the scripture is, some of y'all won't know this, but some of you will. Here's what the intent of the scripture is. The mighty God is Jesus. The prince of peace is he. The everlasting father, the king eternally, the wonderful in wisdom by whom all things were made. The fullness of the Godhead in Jesus is displayed because it's all in him. That word fullness is less anybody wants to argue, fuss, cuss, etc. that Jesus Christ was anything less than fully God and fully man. Every ability that God had, Jesus had. How do you think he, ah, I don't want to go here, but I'm going to go for just a minute. How in the world do you think that he shows up at Samaria, hot, tired, thirsty, wore out, and give out in his humanity, but when the lady shows up at noontime to get her some water, he doesn't worry about being hot, tired, thirsty, or weary anymore, but he begins to step into the arena of God. That's how we knew, go get your husband. She said, ain't got none. And Jesus said, that's right, but you had five, and now you're shacked up with number six. And there's something about him, Brother Ronnie, and I know I've preached this a lot, but there's something about Jesus Christ. He judged her. That's what we would call it, right? And that judgment, I'm putting quotes around it, became her testimony. She said, come see a man. He, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost, told me everything I ever did must be the Christ. Woo! It can't be nobody but him. 
because I showed up. You know, the Bible says she left her water pot too because when you come in contact with Jesus Christ, your priorities change, your needs change, your wants change, everything changes. Well, somebody clap your hands and tell Jesus you love him. Jesus was fully man. He was born of a woman. He went through the birth canal just like every other human does that's not born of a C-section and they may, might have had one of them back then. I don't know. But he stayed in his mama for nine months. He was born and he lived every day just like us. The only difference is there was never any sin in him. That word fullness further validates the completeness of Jesus Christ that while being fully man, he was also fully God. And he wasn't begotten. There is no such thing. You can't find it in the Bible. And I feel very compelled. It's not in my notes, but I feel very compelled to say this. There is no such thing as the eternal son. When Jesus says he was there in the beginning. He was there in the beginning as God. Okay. Let me, let me keep on Hank Snowing. Look here. And you are complete in him. Verse 10. Everything we can be will be, hope to be, need to have or need to be, everything will be found in Jesus Christ. After all, he did say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to go to the Father, you can only come by me. That was his humanity, which made the which made the way. And Brother Terrence, his humanity had to make the way because there wasn't no other humanity that could. Because he said in Ezekiel, I saw a man who could stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And you know what he said? I couldn't find none. I couldn't find none. Look here. Man, I love Wednesday night. My Lord, I love Wednesday night. I feel the Holy Ghost and the anointing so powerful in here. My goodness, I love Wednesday night. Jesus is God. Isaiah 9 and 6, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and of the increase of his kingdom there shall be no end. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. I got my scriptures a little cattywampus there, but and his name shall be called, help me, wonderful, counselor, the what? The what? The mighty God. Look at here. He is God with us. Matthew chapter 1 and 23, the prophet Isaiah prophesied, and it was fulfilled, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. When Thomas, and let me tell y'all something else too. Don't be so hard on Thomas. Don't, don't be so hard on Thomas. There was a lot more to him than just doubting that time. And I'm going to tell you right now, I probably would have doubted too. If for no other reason than I wanted to see it for myself. And it didn't upset the Lord that Thomas said that because he showed up and said, touch me. Okay. Thomas, when Jesus moved into that room and Thomas saw it for himself, he addressed him by saying, my Lord 
and my God, John 20 and 28. Romans 9 and 5 in the New Living Translation says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors. I mean, the New Living Translation reminds you. And Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 26. And God, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Anybody know what manifest means? Made to be seen, made to be clear, oh, revealed. God was manifest in the flesh. Titus chapter 2, verse 13 in the New King James Version. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can't see God. He's a spirit. The only face of God we'll ever see is Jesus Christ. <coughs> All right. Jesus is the Father incarnate. He is God in human form. Because Isaiah 9 and 6 again, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. John 10 and 30, he very powerfully declares, I and my Father are one. We're the same. Look here. John 14 and 9. I just read this the other day, and I felt it again. I think, the Bible doesn't say this, but I think the Lord would have liked to thump Philip on the end of the nose when he said, have I been sold? Boy, I could preach a message off of that right now. Have I been so long time with you and you don't know me? When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 1 John 3, 1 through 5. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right. That ain't the best. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. He is the Father incarnate. The Holy Spirit was the Spirit that was in Jesus Christ. John 14 and 17, I gave you that wrong, Sister Heidi, I think maybe. Jesus said to his disciples, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Remember John chapter number one? He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Look at here. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Look at here. He's talking to the disciples. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you. Who is that? Jesus. And shall be. Okay. Okay. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Peter is wrapping his message up, and he says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God, oh, my Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. Therefore, 
being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. That's Jesus. He hath shed forth this. Everybody say this. this. Which you both see and hear. I looked that word shed up. It means to gush forth or pour out. They came by him, <laughs> and they was going to break his legs, and they found out he was already dead, so they cut a hole in his side, remember, drove a spear in his side, and out of it gushed forth blood and water, <coughs> shed. When Jesus left, he shed forth the Spirit. I don't have time to unpack it all, but I'm going to tell you the book says, and I'm going to probably not quote it right because i got about a thousand going in my mind, that if the same Spirit that brought Christ forth from the grave dwelleth in you, he will also quicken your mortal body. You know where that spirit came from? He hath shed forth this. You see that, Brother Christian? Well, don't nod your head because I might make you get up here and give a Bible study on it. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. He said, he has shed forth this which you both see. What did they see? No, Jesus has done ascended. They saw the Holy Ghost working on people. And what were they hearing? And there were dwelling in Jerusalem. People out of every nation under heaven. And they looked to one another and said, what meaneth this? Do we not hear every man speaking in the tongue of which we were born? It was the Holy Ghost. Huh? You see that? Y'all see that? Now, Shelly, everybody you know ought to know you go to church on Wednesday night. <laughs> I was going to say that to the last person, Shelly, but I didn't know who it was, so. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Tell them I'm almost done. <laughs> they were seeing and hearing men and women Exuberant, worshiping, demonstrative, and speaking in other tongues. It was the Holy Ghost. All right. So the mission of Jesus Christ, I told you we had three problems, right? In order to be reconciled to God, you got to know God. You got to want to be reconciled to him. It's got to be possible to be reconciled to him. And neither of those things are going to be possible as long as sin continues to be powerful in its separation of man and God. So, the first thing Jesus did is he declares God. John chapter 1, verse number 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom, inside the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. That word declared means 
Man, I hope I'm being clear, because if I am, whew, that word declared means lead out completely. Thoroughly bring forth. Meaning all that we need to know of God, we find in Jesus Christ. He declared him. Oh, my Jesus. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted like we were, yet without sin. He declared him. There's an old song. I want to sing it sometimes. But it says, he came down to my level when I couldn't get up to his. And y'all remember that other song? I've even preached about that, Brother, Brother Merle Ewing on the Gaither deal. He knew that for me to become like him, he must first become like me. He declared God. He made it where I can know who he is. Look here. Man, if you want to write down in your notes, maybe go home and Google. There are seven I am statements in the book of John, which the one I'm giving to you tonight is not generally considered to be one of them. And I can't figure it out except... If they called it one of the I am statements, they would have to say Jesus was I am. I don't know, but look here. In the annals of Jewish history, there's a monumental event that is key to them even having an identity. Moses, the great leader, deliverer, Meekest man who ever lived, conduit of the law. His name is forever connected to the giving of the law. When he, living in exile, as it were, finally received the call from God for which he was created. Validating the hand of God being on him from birth, God comes, compels him to go and lead the people of God out of bondage into the promised land. While he's tending sheep on the backside of the desert, a, a fire lights up in a bush, but the bush ain't on fire. And the Lord called to him out of the bush and said, Moses, come here a little closer. And then when he got a little closer, he said, pull your shoes off, brother. Because you're standing on holy ground. He said, I want you, I've heard the cry of my people. I want you to go back to Egypt and get them. And Moses said, you got the wrong guy. I tried that. Didn't work. Finally, the Lord, he says, I'll send Aaron with you because he can talk better than you. And, and he finally got him to convince to go. And then the Lord says, well, if, who do I tell him sent me? Because if I just show up saying, let my people go, it's not going to mean anything to anybody. And he said, tell them, I am that I am has sent you. Brother Talmadge French has an incredible series on this. Verse 52 of John chapter 8. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know you've got a devil in you. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you're saying if a man keep my saying, he'll never taste of death. Then they said to Jesus, are you greater than Abraham our father, which is dead? The prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered and said, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say he's your God. You've not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I'd be a liar, just like 
Boy, Jesus didn't play. He said, I'd be a liar just like you. But I know him and I keep his saying. Look here. <coughs> Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Look at verse 57. Then the Jews said unto him, these things don't add up, partner. You ain't even 50 years old yet. And you saw Abraham? And the Lord said, Oh, my goodness. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham, oh, my Lord Jesus. Before Abraham was, I am. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Them Pharisees didn't catch the cross. Them Pharisees didn't catch the ministry of Jesus Christ. But they knew what he said right here. So there was no doubt in the mind of anybody that heard Jesus say, before Abraham was, I am. He was telling them, I am. Jesus was the I am of the burning bush. He was the I am of the pillar of the cloud and the pillar of the fire. He was the rock in the wilderness. He was the voice that spoke off the top of the mountain. And what does that mean for us? You know what that means for us? He's I am. He, you need peace, he's peace. You need healing, he's healing. You need an identity, he's your identity. You need provision, he's your provider. You need saving, he's your savior. He's everything I need. There has got to be some faith rise up in this room right now that whatever you face in your life, uh, walking out this door, maybe right now, in the morning, next month, next week, uh, that you get a revelation that he is I am. He is not I was. He is not I will be. He is I am. Yeah. He's I am when I'm hungry. He's I am when I'm full. He's I am when I'm strong. He's I am when I'm weak. He's I am when I got money. He's I am when I'm broke. He's I am when I'm working. He's I am when I ain't. He's I am when my family's happy. He's I am when my family's sad. He's I am when my kids mind. He's I am when my kids are in rebellion. That's why. The psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, the whole time I'm preparing this, please be seated for just a minute. The whole time that I'm preparing this, there's an itch in the back of my head that the Lord is saying, if they'll believe it. If they'll believe it. It's my word. It's forever settled in heaven. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide his word in my heart that I might not sin against God. I am born again by the word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word won't pass away. And in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hang with me just a few minutes. 
He came. Oh, Lord. He came so that I might know him. He came so that I might know him. I might have hope because in me on this level right here if I have hope in this life only I'm of all men most miserable but they sing it sometimes maybe they don't sing it but one of my friends on YouTube sings it when my back was against the wall and it looked like it was over he made a way. He wants to show up tonight. He showed up tonight for everybody in here to know he still I am. Whatever you got going on in your life, whatever you're struggling with in your life, he's I am. And he wants you to know everything's going to be all right as long as you look to him. I, I hate to keep referring to the bread, but it's powerful. That's why we got to read it every day. I, I was so sad again the other day when I read about Asa and all the great things he did and, and all, all of the, the blessings that God showed up on his life. But, but there was one time, Brother Shannon, that he went around asking for help from people. And he didn't consult the Lord. And the man of God showed up and said, What's wrong with you, brother? What did God do to cause you to go to somebody else? And Asa got ticked off at him. Threw him in jail. The man of God. He went out and got his booty kicked. And then he got sicker. God help us. He got sick in his feet. And the Bible says, he was so cotton picking, stubborn. And he just went looking for doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor and refused to turn back to God. The Lord, I got some more to teach, but if the Lord don't come, I got some more Wednesdays too. <laughs> or if he don't, if I don't tap out. But I, I got to stay right here for just a minute. I'm, I'm going to not quote this right. I mess it up all the time. But Paul said, I'm scared. He said, see, I've espoused you to him. I'm afraid as the serpent beguiled Eve, so might your minds be moved away from the simplicity of the gospel. You know what the simplicity of the gospel is? Just believe he's who he said he was. That's it. That just believe, that, that is a good message. If you believe he's who he said he was. That matters. He's more than just a story in December and April. He's more than just a genie in the bottle that you call on when all hell breaks loose in your life. He's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. He said, I am. I am the God that healeth. Somebody's got to get a hold that he's I am for you. For you. He is I am always. And when you wade off into Egypt and they don't give you no respect and they don't believe what you say and they won't listen to the word of God, you won't stick if you don't have a burning bush revelation. 
Moses was jacked up from the floor up, Brother Derek. He, you, you read over in Stephen's account, and he was educated, he was articulate, he had everything going for him. But on the backside of the desert, he couldn't even talk plain. But he said, I am that I am. Brother Burns, I wonder what day it was. I wonder what day it was that that mob was sitting around drinking coffee. Or maybe they were nailing on a horseshoe. And all of a sudden, Brother Terrence, they dropped the hammer, they dropped the nails, and said, I am. We heard him. We heard him speak. He told us who he was. Brother Skipper, we had the opportunity right then to fall down on our knees and lay down before him and acknowledge him as who he was. We missed it. What in the world do you think when they realize one day, hold on a minute, wasn't no devil. He wasn't crazy. He wasn't possessed. And he wasn't wrong. The Bible's full of them stories. I'm wrapping it up. I'll finish this some other time. But you've got to know he is for you. He is for you. He is for you. Stand with me. I'm stopping right there because we can go on, man, I got some good stuff over in Hebrews chapter 9 about the blood, and, and we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. And I really wanted to get today when it said the blood of bulls and calves and goats was good for cleaning up your flesh. But the Bible says his sacrifice for the purging of my conscience. I don't know about you all, but ooh, I, let me tell you why he can't say that, Sister Crystal. Because when he talked about purging my conscience, I, I don't want nobody in this room reading that book. I don't want nobody reading that story. Because there's some things up in here in this gourd. I'm going to teach it. I'm just kind of giving you a preview right this minute. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He, he washed it. See why we talk about coming to church and we talk about going to recovery and we talk about coming to elements uh, because you're going to go out there all day and you're going to walk through the muck and you're going to walk through the mire and you're going to walk through the devil's playground uh, and you're going to rub shoulders with regenerate people and ungodly people and unholy people and you've got to come to the house of God yeah. where you be reminded yeah. you're clean. Dear Lord Jesus, I honor you tonight. I praise you. I glorify you. You are the one true living God. Beside you, there is no other. I know not any. You are the wheel in the middle of the wheel. You are the one that sat on the throne in Revelation. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the ending, which is and was and is to come, the Almighty. I'm thankful, God, for the power of the Holy Ghost that's in this room right now. I'm thankful for the revelation that's flowing. I'm thankful for the faith that is being 
being birthed at the hearing of the word. I am thankful, God, for the overcoming power that is being loosed into this room. If we'll just believe, everything changes. When we're connected to you, everything changes. And when we realize that sin has lost its power because of you, we win. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Last Sunday morning, I, uh, I walked in the front, and I was standing about right here. And uh, I, I knew Brother Burns and Sister Burns were going to be here. I knew that they were kind of just pumping the brakes in ministry. And, uh, I had no intentions of asking him to preach, mainly because I wasn't sure if he was comfortable with it. I wasn't sure what he wanted to do. And I walked right here, and the Holy Ghost said, go ask Brother Burns to preach next Sunday. And so I, I might have been born at night. And that wasn't one I wanted to buck the Lord. So I went and asked him. And so he's going to be ministering to us on Sunday morning because God's got a plan. God's got a, God's got a plan. But... I fully intended to respect Brother Burns' sabbatical spirit, <laughs> but the Holy Ghost had a different thing in mind. I thought that his and my relationship, he, did, he doesn't really know this, but the Lord's going to work on revealing it to him. But I told him the other day, his and my relationship is not where he waits on me to ask him anything. He shows up and tells me, what needs to happen. That's how much I trust him and believe in him. And uh, so the Holy Ghost wants Brother Burns to minister to us on Sunday morning. And uh, we're going to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 10 o'clock is elements. I do not know if the air will be fixed. But if it ain't, he's I am. I sent a message to try to find out about it today. We're talking about the air in the family center. But if it's not fixed, we'll have recovery in here again. We'll have it set up for you. Um, if you've never been to recovery, please come at least one time. One time. I'm happy to tell you we had two people show up from Parma last night at five minutes before the meeting closed. They said, we've been driving by and seeing this sign in the yard, and we wanted to come so bad, but we were ashamed. I said, well, come on in. And they came on in and they introduced themselves to everybody. The Lord said, if you go there, I'll bless it. He said, if you go there, I'll bring them in. And guess what? Here they come. Because he's I am. He said, if I the son of man be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We got to believe it. The simplicity of the gospel. Simplicity of the gospel. Brother Cody Pikey. Pray us out of here, brother. Now, y'all just sit tight for just a second. Don't go about nowhere. Come here, Sister Meredith. She's the best secretary. <laughs> this side of podium. Y'all sit down for just a second. Stephanie, come here. Come on here, sweetie. I'm gonna let everybody go, but I, I cut I, I quit like early. Come on up here. This is my friend Stephanie. I'd sometimes call her Samantha, and that's mainly that's mainly because I want everybody to correct me. I know what her name is. I call her Samantha on purpose. But her name is Stephanie Brooks. And she is at the mission right now. And life messed her up. Life. This is the sweetest gal. I don't know how anything ever went sideways in her life. I believe it's all lies. Okay. <laughs> I believe it's all lies, but 
God has done miracle after miracle in this young lady's life. We thought we were going to lose her. We lost her for a weekend. And the Lord sent an angel. She came back to us. But she was, due to circumstances in life, she was unable to finish high school. And we got together. Uh, the mission, the Deb, and some different ones got together. And they got her in a program. And yesterday or today? Yesterday. Stephanie graduated from high school with her diploma. We're so proud of you, girl. We're so proud of you. Aren't we proud of her? We're so proud of her. We got you a card and we got you a little gift in there. And my wife said to tell you, if you wouldn't be so private, we would have had you caked and punched and all that stuff. But you deserve it. We love you, Stephanie, and we're here for you, and we're so proud of you. God bless you. You're dismissed.